of you who know about the, the center, we organize different events in the Webster Center for Creativity and Innovation. We have uh, talks every two months, and this is one of them. Actually, it's quite a unique format because we'll have, we're spoiled today, we have two speakers coming from the same uh, region in France, but talking about slightly different um, approaches to the same topic, creativity and innovation. Uh, we also organize workshops, hackathons, uh, we have a big creativity week in June, so if you're not on the email list of the center, do let me know and, and we can add your email. What we open with this year is uh, a discussion of processes and contexts for creativity and innovation, and uh, we have a panel with Dr. Pierpaolo Andriani uh, and with Dr. Renata Kaminska, first coming from Tech Business School and Renata from Schema Business School uh, and University Côte d'Azur, so southern France, where the weather probably is a bit better than here. Uh, and they're going to, to talk to us about uh, one particular process of innovation, in the case of Pierpaolo, and about the city as a create, uh, creativity, a context for creativity in the case of Renata. They have uh, 20 minutes each, more or less, and then we'll have a, a small discussion together uh, in a panel. So I'm inviting Pierpaolo first <coughs> to give the, the present, his presentation. So let me put the PowerPoint. Ah, okay, didn't hear. Yeah. Perfect. This is you? Yeah. Good. The floor is yours. Okay. Um, well, thanks to Vlad for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about a mix of history of science and technology and innovation. It is reversed in the sense you have to You have to speak up because even I don't. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to talk about innovation with, from a strong historical um, viewpoint. It is reversed in the sense that it's innovation coming from objects and later on perceived by actors, rather than the other way around. So I am going to, to use that word called exaptation, which I'm going to mention in a moment. Just an historical case. Uh, uh, in the 18th, the first half of the 18th century, there will be parties in which people, well respected men, gentlemen, uh, were invited to inhale um, so called laughing gas, nitric <laughs> oxide. And then it was noticed that by chance people falling down but not perceiving pain. And in, 18, in the 1840s, a doctor actually used a laughing gas in order to extract a tooth without pain. So an aesthetic, the major revolution in 19th century medicine came indirectly from laughing gas. So it was an indirect consequence of those parties. And this is one portrait of the first anesthetic surgery uh, used. So the point is whether there's a modality of innovation in which the actor, the agent, the scientist, the technologist, perceives uh, behaviors, or that perceives an emergent function coming from the interaction between an object and a certain environment. And that's the case. I'm going to give another example. Um, so basically, do my, I've got a set of questions. Do unseen properties of existing technology influence innovation? Notice this is the other way around, as it is usually um, conceived. So another interesting case, and I usually come from this object, but I was flying, so I didn't want to be stopped. <laughs> well, that's, that object is a magnetron. It's basically a military thing, usually uh, originally um, developed by the British, and then uh, engineered by the Americans in the Second World War. It was a major project, scientific technology project, Second World War. Together, of course, with the Manhattan Project. And this guy called uh, Percy Le Spencer in 1945 was playing with the magnetron, which is an object that generates microwave radiation at a certain frequency. And the mystery of the melted chocolate. <laughs> Basically, he had a chocolate or peanut chocolate butter, that brand over there. It took some time to find a brand. And, oh, sorry. And, and he noticed that it met in his pocket. 
Now, that's not a big thing for us. It was a big thing then because it was the first time in the history of humankind that cooking had been achieved without the presence of heat. And two years later, you had the first microwave called the radar range, just as an atavism of the, and so uh, this is another case in which an unsuspected property of a military, in this case, technology gave rise to a fundamental new industry, innovation new industry. 1947, that was the first object. And just because it's nice to talk about a real thing, um, I found this magazine, it's a 1952 Life magazine, and it's interesting because page 20, there's a story of a new drug. This is a story. The new drug was tested in 1952, in this case in New York, and it was an anti-tuberculotic drug. It was so effective that patients that were basically moribund gained weight in a few weeks, and they were seen dancing, they became euphoric. So this drug that was introduced to fight tuberculosis became the first antidepressant. And at the, at the time where even the word antidepressant did not exist. And this is another case of, I can do this there, sorry. <laughs> and that was a, an astonishing case of um, innovation. The return to life was so wonderful, so invigorating that disciplinary problems were common. A factor which is obviously attribu attributable to resurgent animal vigor. <laughs> that is <laughs> 1950s language. <laughs> so, um, but this idea that innovation may be originated and shown by objects is actually an, an idea that comes directly from Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin, in, actually in the 1859 edition of The Origins, basically says, look, an organ which has been evolved by natural selection for flotation actually became the origin of respiration. Why? How do you flotate? By extracting gas from a liquid. The gas you extract is oxygen. Oxygen reacts. And then you start respiration. So, Darwin basically introduced the concept that now we call exaptation, that the historical function of a trait, technology, an artifact, an organ, may differ from the current function. And that idea was forgotten by, by um, evolution and biology until the end of the 19th, uh, 20th centuries, when it was re resuscitated by Jay Gould. But to be historically honest, the Italians got that better and first. <laughs> I'm Italian. Um, I, I excluded the slide. Oh, why did I exclude the slide? Because actually, the first one to uh, present the concept was. Um, well, it's not. I oh, know it is there. Sorry, the f um, I'm skipping around. So, in. Um, so this Darwin, the typical example is actually evolutionary biologist feathers. Feathers were introduced basically for thermal regulation and for sexual selection, basically, the core, colors. And then they were co-opted for flight. So you have dinosaurs with feathers, not scales. And then those feathers, later on, later dinosaurs used the feathers in order to fly. All dinosaur stuff, no doubt. Um, uh, the then this, this was defined exaptation by Stephen Jay Gould and Elizabeth Verba in 1982. Tra trades, I will say technologies or artifacts, conceived, developed, or selected for a, for a purpose are co-opted for a different purpose. And that's the original uh, definition. I'm happy to give the slides. So if you, um, as I said, the Italians, the Italians, the Latins, got the first. In fact, Lucretius, in the Rerum Natura, one of the most beautiful books ever written, one of the most influential books ever written in the history of humankind, basically said, look, there was no side before the arms, and no speaking of words before the tongue was made, but rather the origin of the tongue came long before speech. Clearly, it used to do something else, 
which Lucrezius doesn't say. And he calls the idea that function drives the evolution of forms perverted reasoning. And this is in, 19, in 49 before Christ. <laughs> so this is quite, it was quite a big uh, Lucretius. So having said, okay, this thing exists, then can we measure it? So how many, is this a rare occurrence or is this a frequent occurrence? So, and this is what we tried to do um, some years ago, and we got a partial measure, okay? So what do we do? We took drugs. Why did we take drugs? Because we can clearly distinguish between artifacts, the drugs, and the functions they play, the uses, which are classified in international databases. That's easy to do. We exploited something called off-label uses. The fact that drugs introduced for a purpose may actually evolve for the purposes called off-label in, in, in the literature. Just an example, this is one of the drugs we studied, tocopol. Tocopol was introduced for Parkinson, ended up being effective against depression. Now, between Parkinson and depression, there's no relationship, at least not first degree relationship. You may be depressed because of Parkinson, but the drug may act on depressed without having Parkinson, without showing the symptoms of Parkinson. So what did we, what did we do? Basically, we took we classified all the uses of all the drugs approved by the, F the Federal Drug Administration in three years. We took all the pairs, original use for which the drug was developed and emergent uses. And then we said, we studied whether the use was functionally novel or not. I'm going to give other examples. And we kind of find that about 42%, take it or leave of course, are functionally novel among the emergent uses, and in the totality of uses, about 30% of all uses are accepted. Okay? In the pharma drug in the pharma field, those drugs over there. So acceptation, what is acceptation? Is the emergence of functions from already existing artifacts developed, approved, or naturally selected in the case of biological traits. <coughs> evolved for other reasons, and later copied for uh, new ones. So, and then another question, are the new f these new functions important? So we know they exist, we know more or less how many, the, the frequency, are they important? And, well, this is, we took a drug, a particular drug in our database <coughs> called thalidomide. Thalidomide was the worst scandal of pharmaceutical history by far and large, terrible. It caused horrible malformation in fetuses. But then, it was resurrect, resurrected. And it became, and it developed, this was originally approved for insomnia and morning sickness in pregnant women, and then it was resurrected, and it gave rise to all those new functions. Many of them are really, really, really important. That one in particular, Erythema nodosum leprosum, erythema is a skin condition, but when you get erythema with leprosy, it becomes an extremely painful condition. And a few years later, so the drug was withdrawn in, in, at, at the end of the 50s, beginning of the 60s, and in 1964, uh, this guy, Dr. Sheskin, gave this drug that was discarded to a patient with erythema nodosum leprosum, the guy was cured, but basically most leprosies were cured by a drug approved for insomnia and morning sickness. And this book says basically 90% of the leprosies hospitals were shut down. So this, this modality of developing innovation is frequent and it can be important. Um, another example uh, we, we like to give is this. We took one material, then we want to say, okay, let's take one material, let's see the importance, <laughs> the unfolding of innovations coming from a, one material. And the material is coal tar, you know, coal tar we're producing shampoos, what not me, but <laughs> it's gone down. Uh, and, uh, you know, we use for, for asphalt, for, yes, sir. In all your examples, we could understand how we became aware, scientists became aware, the public became aware. 
that a new use was possible. But in the case of thalidomide, how, how did this doctor have a hint that it could be effective against leprosy? It's an interesting question, which actually links to the discussion we're having about agenti. So uh, erythema, notosum leprosum, has an indirect effect. It is so painful that patients die for lack of sleep. So Dr. Shestin said, well, this is an insomnia. It may cure, actually, it's an hypnotic. So it may cure insomnia, then it may work to alleviate the symptoms. And then he noticed that <laughs> The, 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 the problem was gone. So it got there indirectly. So it's, it's a good point. It got there very indirectly. So anyway, going back, coal tar. Coal tar is a complex molecule, and, and uh, coal tar contains <coughs> phenol, and then uh, a British doctor called Joseph Lister discovered that by using coal tar, it could do antiseptic surgery. That's the beginning of what we call modern surgery. Mortality dropped from 40% to about 15%. And after that, it was modern surgery. Coal tar contains aniline. Okay, aniline, by chance, a uh, eight year old chemist, British again, Thomas Perkin, was playing trying to find artificial quinine to cure malaria, and he got the fruit at artificial colorant. And that became the foundation of the modern chemical industry. In fact, if you look even at the name of the mod, the biggest Swiss or German pharmaceutical company, they include the word Farbe, which means color, BASP. Yeah, the final F is color. And this is the beginning of chemical industry. Then one of the dyes that were discovered was made in blue. And a German doctor, Paul Ehrlich, used that, used the colorant against malaria. That was the first ever drug. And we can go on. This is the case I've presented, but then a French doctor, Henri Laboury, uh, developed, developed, kind of found you know, a derivative metal in blue, and this became the first uh, antipsychotic, the foundational model of uh, psychopharmacology, and so on and so on. We can go on, and of course, we can give all the details. So, and then final question, and I close. The answer is implicit by now. So is this model, is this is this acceptation, the emergence of new uh, functions in existing materials or technologies can actually become a mode of discovery of science and technology and of course, uh, innovation science. So, and yes, it does. So going back to my <laughs> example of, uh, our example of, of uh, this is still used in France. It's called Marcelide in France. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting story why it is still used in France. But anyway, it was introduced as anti-tuberculotic, basically to kill bacteria. And then it developed an unexpected function, which is antidepressant, relying on a completely different mechanism of action, the way a drug works in the body. Basically it became a neurotron, a modulator, controlling absorption and, uh, and emission, if you want, of dopamine and neurotransmitter. At the time, when there was no idea, there was, oh no, there was no science of neurotransmitters modulation. And it gave rise to a, to a theory, which is the chemical imbalance of neurotransmitter in the brain, that didn't exist at the time. And we can go on and so on. This guy says there were no antidepressants. There was even the concept that there might be such a group, such a group of drugs. In fact, we went and checked for the word antidepressant. If you use n-gram, n-gram does uh, mathematical sociology, if you want. You put antidepressant. This basically measures the frequency of words in all published books scanned by Google. So that's pretty good. So this is frequency of the name of the drug, Ipronazid, 1952, and it's the frequency of the word antidepressant. The word antidepressant did not exist. It is a consequence of the emergence of an antidepressant as a function which didn't have a t theory before. And um, it's interesting to speculate. Uh, it's another example for farm again. I've got four, three minutes, two minutes. 
So this is, of course, everybody knows about Viagra. Viagra was in a way developed for angina pectoris, so cardiovascular to the problem. Um, and then it was accepted into for erectile dysfunction. But then it relies on the mechanism of action, which is basically this one, nitric oxide pathway. So this is connected to the beginning, to the example I gave at the beginning, the laughing gas. And it uses as a modulation of a certain enzyme, phosphodiesterase. But then now Viagra, it's benefit to be correct, is used for another condition, which is pulmonary disease, which uses a different mechanism of action. So yes, it is a discovery mode because it highlights the way in which the artifact acts on its environment, in this case the human body, with a certain morbidity, certain problem, using a different mechanism of action. And if you say, okay, but all examples from pharma, this is an example from uh, <laughs> communication. So the GPS uh, is a guidance system based on this set of satellites with extremely synchronized timing and so on. So you can do smart bombs or assisted landing on. But you can also, the signal, the radiation, interacts with the atmosphere. And by using a different principle, you can actually do volcanic ash measurements indirectly in order to uh, contribute to the safety of flights. And so my conclusions. Exactly processes do contribute to innovation. They depend on what we could define, but the literature here becomes controversial, and seen properties of existing technologies, and they also constitute a mode of discovery. And that's, I've skipped all sorts of details, and of course the devil is in the details. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very You're much, dear Paulus. I, I invite you to, uh, to the answer, and I invite Renata. So this was a fascinating uh, example of how solutions are sometimes looking for a problem, right? Absolutely. And then Renata will present us with a, quite a different context that then we're going to put together. Um, perfect. So, oh, a security alert. No, cancel. Don't. <laughs> Renata, here you go. I don't, can you give me a watch? Because I have no idea. I don't have a watch. So I, I can tell you five minutes or okay. something, yeah? Um, Dear Paolo has this wonderful watch that doesn't give you time. Yeah, good, yeah. It gives you a latitude, it gives you all kinds of things. Okay, so I will talk about com something completely different. Um, when uh, Vlad um, asked us uh, to come here, I was um, working on a project um, that was developed with colleagues at the University of Côte d'Azur. It's a new university in, uh, in the south of France, of which my school schema is now a, a, a founding partner. So it's a network. So anyway, we started working on this, um, on this uh, uh, project that um, had for, uh, how do I go down? This one. The for how do I go uh, from one slide to another? I think from here, this one. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so the project just finished. And um, the objective of the, or the title of the project, as you can see, it, it concerned career paths of artists um, uh, in, the, in the region of French Riviera. Um, the issue there was that the, Everybody knows where French Riviera is. Everybody knows where Nice is. Everybody kind of thinks Nice, French Riviera, um, beautiful weather, and a lot of um, artistic activities because there is a uh, Cannes, Cannes Film Festival. The, sh the truth is completely different, or the reality is different. Um, in this region, there's a lot of um, um, institutions that train artists. And these young people go through these schools and they don't stay. So in the end, there is a big problem because we, um, the, the local institutions or the governments of these cities around or in the, on, on the French Riviera notice that basically there is not that much happening in terms of dynamic creative um, activities in, in, in the region. So they, they 
came to us and they said, go and try to understand why. Why is it that everybody's leaving? Why is it that basically um, uh, the, 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 there is this problem, right? So the project has many different objectives here. Um, with another colleague, um, I focused on this one. So some colleagues were trying to kind of understand why young artists leave. Others were trying to understand whether the digital um, uh, devices had, or Facebook, the networks, the <coughs> social networks, had any impact on the networks that uh, these artists have been or have not been able to create in order to um, maybe enable their, their professional um, development and, and their kind of you know, staying in the region and so on. And I started uh, from a completely different uh, perspective um, that was kind of motivated by, um, by papers written by a, a colleague from HEC Montréal, Patrick Coende, who wrote on, um, on, basically he wrote this one paper, it's called uh, the, um, the Anatomy of a Creative City, and he describes, um, he does a big case study on Montreal. And it's a fascinating piece of work. There's a lot of um, uh, things interesting there, things there in, in his. In, so basically, I started with this, um, exchanging with all kinds of um, um, actors um, of the regional cultural, I would say, um, policy making, and, and even even the, the young artists and so on. I realized that the French Riviera and, and the city of Nice had a problem. And I didn't quite, I'm not from Nice, I was, I've been living there for a while, so I didn't quite understand where the problem uh, was coming from. So I started reading. And, and then um, I kind of, uh, with, with colleagues, I, I kind of realized that, uh, so I will use I, but it's, it's all the result of discussions, and so we realized that there were two different um, approaches to the problem. So the, the first approach came or emerged from this uh, debate on, on the emergence and dynamics and, and success of industrial clusters. So a lot of people study why geographically proximate companies create more dynamics and, and basically why Silicon Valley is more um, uh, um, dynamic than, let's say, the place where I come from, <laughs> Sofia on Tripolis, right? which is not really growing that fast and so on. So there's this debate. And then we realize that there is another debate which runs in parallel with that, which is the debate around the creative uh, class, basically led by this guy, Richard Florida. And um, uh, Richard Florida um, focused on one aspect of the regional dynamic, which is um, you know, this, this, the role of all these people uh, in creating and attracting more um, interesting, creative people and um, um, contributing to the overall dynamics of, of the region, right? So he wrote this book, The Rise of the Creative Class, and uh, basically his solution, his answer to the question why some regions were more creative, more dynamic, more economically dynamic as well. Um, his answer was this mix of things, technology, talent, territorial assets, and tolerance. So we kind of sat around with, with colleagues and we had said, okay, so what's, what's wrong with, with, the, with the region where we live? Because we definitely perceive that there is a problem there, right? So what is it? Is it lack of technology, talent, territorial assets, tolerance, or the mix of some of them, and so on? Um, and then we started reading, talking, um, exploring, and basically um, uh, we went back to um, Patrick Coende and his work. And in one of his papers, he um, elaborates a theory of a creative city where he talks about the interaction between these three levels, right? The upper ground, middle ground, and underground. Um, I think that I've defined it a little bit more here. So the upper ground is basically all the formal institutions, organizations, uh, and um, that uh, basically uh, exist in the region and that can help create positive externalities. 
Uh, the underground, we know what underground is. This is basically the underground. It's all these artists, um, uh, entrepreneurs, scientists who, um, you know, uh, kind of uh, materialized here in this picture, uh, basically working in their uh, garages and not really in link with anybody else, but kind of like trying to express something. But he also noticed that there is there is a there is a in between space, which is which he calls the middle ground. Mm -hmm. That middle ground is something that is missing in our region. Uh, for example, in Sofia and Tripolis, the middle ground is are these um, spaces and places where people meet very often informally. So it will be a mix of a Starbucks and something else where people kind of, you know, kind of informally meet, talk, and maybe uh, uh, come up with new projects. So this is, in his theory, the underground is recognized and kind of validated and, and, um, and maybe um, advertised a little bit to the upper ground, <laughs> through the middle ground, right? So it's very, very important to have the middle ground in the, in the region, in the city, in, the, in, in, in these uh, places. So, um, so we started thinking, we started um, um, uh, going around Nice, doing interviews with all these people, but it was not only with these young artists that we kind of realized what was happening in the region. Um, you don't see that much of the underground in the, in the area where we live. We really uh, uh, don't... Uh, don't see a lot of informal <laughs> forms of creativity emerge on the street. There is not that much happening. Or at least we thought that maybe there's a little bit of ha things happening, but we don't see it very well. Well, we're still working on the, on, on the idea, we're still exploring. But anyway, so what we were kind of thinking to ourselves, what makes up this middle ground? And so places, spaces, projects, events, and all these things. Okay, so there's a whole literature of um, and we started thinking with a colleague of mine uh, from the university um, that there is something wrong in the sense that we, s every, whoever we talk to, we we'll always go back to these people, right? So we associate the, the French Riviera with Marc Chagall. There's a beautiful museum, right? And we have a Picasso museum, Matisse museum. We have Renoir has his museum there, and so on. So, Cannes Festival. Van Gogh? Van Gogh? Van Gogh, Van Gogh is, uh, uh, was kind of more in Aix-en-Provence. Yeah. So I'm talking <laughs> French Riviera, kind of Nice, and whatever. Regional rivalry. Right, so everybody knows about these people that, you know, and yeah, he was in Provence, and, and we live a little bit closer to Italy. So. But anyway, so, um, so people think that it's a very creative region, but it's actually, uh, um, you know, the list is very short. So we started reading about Nice, about the history of Nice, about what's going on there, and we realized quite a lot of things are sitting in, um, in the books, actually. So as you may know and may not know, Nice has been um, taken over, uh, taken over <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> so Nice is French. Nice is French since 1860. <coughs> And from the beginning, when we were reading the archives, from the beginning we realized that the, the place was um, uh, positioned immediately as a tourist destination, but a luxury tourism destination for the rich, basically. So from the beginning, when you look at the pictures at, at, at every um, archive, you see this, this, this thing. So, Basically, there were three, we identified three processes that have been operating in it. So basically, you know, the creation of the, of the French identity, uh, forceful creation of the French identity, uh, this, this idea of embracing modernity with, you know, like with these rich people coming there and basically big buildings and so on. And it, 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 it became kind of like a, um, um, a almost a, um, how would I say it, uh, a experimental uh, region for um, um, experimenting with uh, new economic uh, So it's a 
basically it has become very quickly a neoliberal metropolis. And um, the consequence of that was that um, the, um, I would say we've noticed that from the beginning when we read um, uh, newspaper articles and, and um, some papers um, on the topic, we've, we've kind of felt that there was this instrumentalization of culture um, from the beginning. Uh, the first Nice Carnival, I don't know if you've ever been to Nice, was created in 1876, and it was immediately something, an event that was controlled and that was aimed at attracting um, very well of uh, uh, tourists who wanted a little bit of traction, right? So strict control of, of the city's image and, um, and this instrumentalization of culture were two things that we kind of identified immediately, and it just um, uh, seems like uh, like uh, something that it, nobody really uh, talks about anymore. So um, we tried to see if there were different stages in the evolution of the of the region, but um, so we we kind of thought that from 1860 to 47 there was this 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 period where um, the the local governments were trying to create. Uh, the, the official culture or identity of the region, right, through many different uh, uh, things that I just mentioned. Then, right after the Second World War, so from 47 to 75, um, the, the, the region was always governed by more or less the same political um, or, or orientation, which is, well, I probably don't have to explain. Um, and during that time, around you know late fifties, we see the emergence of this thing that's called in French called Ecole de Nice. So a group of artists who started um, rebelling this official kind of a clean, nice, um, nice image of the of the city, and they 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 started organizing all kinds of events and and basically. Uh, uh, creating something that was um, uh, a little bit uh, uh, different. So um, what we see, what we see from, from the analysis of this, and they have, they, they didn't leave a lot of, um, uh, I would say, uh, archives behind them. But some of them are still alive, like Ben, for example. Um, who was part of it, and he was one of the most successful uh, 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 representatives of the Ecole de Nice. It was definitely a, a movement of counterculture, and um, uh, the most interesting thing is that the, the, there was a number of people of which of whom the names would not really be of any significance to most of the people. Um, but Yves Klein, for example, the guy who painted everything in blue. And the local government immediately tried to bypass that emergence of counterculture by creating the Museum of Modern Art in Nice. And they put all their works there. So it's full of um, uh, uh, creations of these people. But, um, the real nature of the movement has been com completely forgotten, and it has, it has been forgotten on purpose, um, because the movement was very much a political movement. They wanted to you know, create something bottom up and, and um, act against the, the, the official, I would say, uh, uh, cult, cult well, official regional culture represented by the different institutions that represented the local government, right? So basically there was this, the, the, we have them, we see them, there are paintings, there are different sculptures there, but we don't know who they are. Nobody has ever heard of the Cordelis, and it was a very important movement of which some of the, uh, as I said, represented. So uh, basically this counterculture in the region is, is represented or uh, personified by, by the, the tension that exists 
between the official Nice festival that always happens in February in Nice, that is supposed to attract rich tourists, or tourists uh, at large, and um, the, the uh, I would say, informal um, carnival that is organized by people in one of the areas of Nice, saint roch uh, that was created in order to uh, counter act on uh, what they believed the, the real culture is. So basically, um, I'm just going to go through this. We, we traced uh, down to the existence of three movements, three groups of people uh, that um, the names uh, are listed here. So they, they had um, different objectives they expressed different objectives uh, in, in their creative, I would say, uh, uh, activities. So, for example, this one, the activation of Niswa culture. So they, they created uh, 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 journals that were written in, uh, in, the, po in the Niswa language, right? And, and they, they, they tried to get as many people on board as possible. They, they, they created, uh, they wrote songs, they, 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 they were, organizing all kinds of different events and so on. And we're talking about the 70s and, and 80s here, so it's not, uh, you know, it's not 200 years ago. Um, so the creation of this independent carnival in, uh, in, in, in saint Hop was organized by this one. And then, uh, for example, Diable Bleu, another <coughs> collective, uh, uh, the, the objective of this collective was to criticize the modern society and basically capitalist, so it was more of a political movement, right? So, um, I'm not sure how much time I have. Uh -huh. how, how does it end? Okay. Nice. Okay, so I have one more minute. So, at the end, we are at the end of um, data collection and at the kind of beginning of the analysis <coughs> of the data that we collected during this project. And we have Two, um, two conclusions, I have two conclusions to share with you today. So the first conclusion is that the creation of this um, independent carnival was in a way a, a, a specific type of a middle ground uh, because it allowed uh, the artists and the, the general public to have a space and to meet and to create something together to create an event that was recurrent every year and that basically um, um, allowed to counteract this idea that um, the, the culture was for the chosen one, for a small elite in the, in the region, right? So these artists, um, it, it's, it, it, was, um, it was basically art for the people and with the people. And it still is going <coughs> on. So basically, these people who are engaged in these things are still there. So we try to conceptualize it a little bit. Um, and because the whole thing is about, the whole idea behind it is about understanding how the middle ground emerges, or what is missing in these, right? And what is missing in, in the region um, that does not allow the, the something to, to, to emerge. So basically, we've noticed that there were a lot of things happening, but um, I've um, uh, synthesized them a little bit uh, here. Basically, con we have continual identity and institutional tensions all the time. So the, these local people, it's, it's a difficult because Nice is, has been non-French before, French now, a lot of people go, pass, and so on. <coughs> so there's this identity question, who is Nisua? Who is, um, you know, who has the right to decide um, how Nice is supposed to develop? Um, the problem with um, uh, real estate. Artists do not have space to gather together, to work, and to exchange with the local population. So um, the constant conflict with the city of Nice. Wherever there is an empty space, the city decides to build a big hotel or a big uh, shopping mall or something. And so these spaces are eaten up and the space is very expensive. So um, 
So this identity institutional change, uh, tension, sorry, led to um, a lot of different things, but basically what was happening is that these artists were um, striving to redefine the role of art in the, in the society. So basically for them, from the interviews that we have, art is a way to live together, to create together, and they are constantly searching this utopia of social, um, social art, kind of artists creating a meeting with the local people and doing things together. It seems completely separated in most of the um, instances of, of cultural life in Nice. We have the Museum of Modern Art, we have the big theater, we have a couple of um, other institutions, the Conservatoire in Nice and so on, but it really is extremely elitist. So this is what they're trying to uh, fight against, right? The second thing that we found was that they were really, throughout the years, trying to um, force onto the local governments this, this this right to squat, to take over um, spaces that were in a habit, they were kind of left alone and, and nobody used them. Because they needed a meeting place for the definition public. definition of artists. Uh, no, of culture. For them, culture is not in the museums, but it's in the street, it's in the interaction with the, with the uh, local people, right? And there, were, there is a constant search for a model of for a model of uh, a culture, cultural place. Sorry, um, open to everybody, but anchored in a local Niswa culture. Okay, and the, the official institutions such as the Museum of Modern Art, the theater, um, and the Conservatoire are for them are anti models of what culture should be and what art is. Okay, so um, many different things, but um, in general, we see that there is resistance, there is political action on behalf, of, like from these people. Um, uh, in 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 the eighties, the moment all these artists were moving from one empty space to another, and the moment they went to the um, uh, city hall and they asked for a permanent space to meet in the eighties, um, they were immediately portrayed as um, you know, political, linked to some kind of an underground drug-related activities, and there were uh, articles in the newspapers in Nice Martin, this is local, the local paper, and even on the national level. So they said the moment we expressed our need to be part of the cultural life in Nice, um, uh, we have been um, uh, perceived as some, some very, very uh, negatively by the, by the local government. And the second, and this is the last thing I'm going to say, is that at some point, um, the, after many, many changes and, and, and fights, and sometimes even actually violent um, uh, exchanges with the, the local government, uh, or the police, or whatever, the, the, the city decided to uh, tribute a space um, for these artists. They were the old slaughterhouses that were um, you know, just left kind of abandoned a little bit. Uh, it's called Entrepont. It's in a pretty unpopular part of Nice, but um, uh, this, this space is, has become now, it's been going on, I don't know when they opened, but a few years ago. Uh, basically, the, it's, it's, a, it's a physical space um, that uh, welcomes all kinds of associations, artistic associations, it, it's a federation, and we are in the midst of understanding how it works because it's, it's, it's a place where they actually materialize this desire to, um, to produce with the public, to, to make the artists meet the public and basically give them space. You can see that this is actually our project we invited artists to produce uh, a, a, a <coughs> some kind of a representation of what was going on in the region. That was a few months ago, and um, you know, this is you can clearly see that basically there is life there. There's more than just so. Um, um, thank you very much. I leave it there, but um, I just wanted to share this with you because 
um, there is not that much um, research on, there's some research on the creativity in different cities, but there's not that much research on how these, these middle ground spaces emerge, <coughs> what are the underlying mechanisms behind the emergence of these underground, middle ground spaces. Excellent. Thank you very much, Renata. And now I'm going to invite both of you back yeah. to the to the Lille chairs. I know that time flies and we started a little bit late, but I want just to make a, a connection a bit between the two talks and give you a chance to ask a few questions and then we have a, a glass of wine. But it, it, it was just fascinating. Initially, when uh, when we talked about the, the talk, the joint talk, I thought both of you will come to talk about the same topic and then I realized we talked about very different topics. Yes. And I, I didn't panic, but I thought, oh, what are we going to do? And now I see clearly the connection between them. Like this new space you talked about, if we think about the mechanism uh, Pier Paolo talked about, we might think about new functions that can emerge that artists themselves don't foresee for the space. And actually, they're looking for those functions. So in a way, there is a deeper connection, I think, between the two. Any questions that you might have or observations or uh, related to any of the talks? Yes. Yeah, first, uh, Pier Paolo, thanks very much. It was very insightful. In the story of how something begins as one thing and then ends up as something else, a pretty crude oversimplification, but um, is there a, um, I guess, a, an understand, a better understanding of how in the beginning where there's a creator or an innovator or an inventor, and they have the attributes probably of creativity and curiosity to come up with their pharmaceutical or invention, or whatever it is, then it lives its life and, and gets stuck along the way. And it's someone else, it seems, to come along and stumble into that thing and turn it into something maybe far more useful than the original. Um, what are the attributes of that second person that came along? Are they um, more analysts in looking at patterns, or are they really explorers? Or what, what, you, have you done any research into that space? Or is it the environment that you work in? They happen to be living in a middle ground area that mm. enables them to do that. That's a good question. I'm personally interested in the history of technologies per se, so I never really explored <coughs> the issue of the, <coughs> the agency of the agents. Now, clearly agents play a role there, and <coughs> we know it since uh, Louis Pasteur, you know, chance favors only the prepared mind. But the issue of what that preparedness means is, uh, is something that something that I don't know much about. Uh, but they clearly struggle two environments. They're clearly in two, in two, in two, in two, uh, in several shoes. For instance, one of the reasons why Joseph Lister, the founder of antiseptic surgery, was able to make the jam from carbolic acid to antiseptic surgery is because he was basically the only person living probably in the world was the best microscopist, his father basically had the first micro, the best microscopist in the world. He was a scientist at the time with surgeons were practical people and he was a surgeon as well. Only those three things allowed him to connect chemistry, surgery by a microscopy. So th the problem is that those conditions cannot be anticipated and that's where the agency becomes 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 a crucial issue. Thank you, Elaine. There, there's a the big push now for resilient cities, and you have the Sabatella and the resilient cities. And there's something for me that I'm interested in. Can you speak up a little? No, I haven't. The resilient <laughs> cities. Resilient yes, cities. I will translate. Yeah, well, will speak up. Yeah. Um, <coughs> Don't worry. You can you can whisper. Uh, I'll, I'll echo. Thank you. Do you have a mic? You have a mic. You do have mics. Yes. <laughs> Go on, Elaine. I'll, I'll make so it. it I'm fascinated by the what makes a, the the link between a creativity contributing to a resilient city, but also in the the, the kind of danger that we're blindly walking into. the whole interaction of uh, senses and, and senses, mm -hmm. which start to determine and shape behaviors, control behaviors, 
but also those directly to appoint a board to then start to formalise behaviour and shape it to, to close down cases and keep it being shaped. So I'm not sure where my question is, but <laughs> no, how, in, how, you know, how, how is all that playing in? So, so cities, if I uh, that 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 kind of are designed in ways that guide behavior so much that they almost control it and leave little space. Yeah, designing cities in that way that we think might be more more easy to to travel into, but they're actually much more constraining, right? To to live in. It, it needs becoming that. I have no idea. <laughs> nice is definitely a, an experimental city in terms of um, artificial intelligence and, and kind of the cameras everywhere. I read a paper on that, but uh, experimental. They invest quite a lot of money in that, and they, I, I don't I, I don't know that much about it. I just read a little bit about it, but that's that's all. But my, my that was the project that we have uh, developed here. That was not the objective. The objective was to understand, for some of my colleagues, which was my, not my interest, um, and we will talk about it when they analyze the data a little bit more, whether, um, for example, digitalization, so digital devices, allow these young artists to create networks, allowing them to be a little bit more successful and stay in the region or something. So um, we will probably have some idea, more ideas about that, but, you know, the control, controlling aspect I have no idea no idea but it is it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting question but it's just yeah. A, yeah maybe also the side effect of, of things we we think are for the safety of cities but turn out to be great control mechanisms to think of also multiple functions yes there was a, another comment yeah and, uh, mm, yes um, first I like to vindicate your theory mm -hmm. I don't know if vindicate is the correct word <laughs> because for instance, certainly tonight I could have dinner with a pretty artist living in a squat. But that would be the, what you call it, not underground, uh, no. Underground. Uh, underground. Yeah. At the same time, you may know or you don't, that these days, starting today through Sunday, there is a big art show in Geneva, Art Genève. And tonight at 5.30, so I had to decide, Regard sur l'art contemporain en temps de crise et l'exemple de Zao Vuki avec Dominique de Villepin, invité d'honneur. This is typically up, up yes. <laughs> And I let you the, the fact that I opted for you is a clear <laughs> confirmation of your theory. And, and I'm not making fun. Vlad know that if I am very fond of this university, it's not because I have a, I was born with a special worship of American <laughs> University or Western. It is because it has the pluses and sometimes minuses of the middle ground. That's the perfect example. Mm -hmm. And it makes it much more authentic mm -hmm. and much more, in a way, open to question marks. A big university, a uh, big uh, exhibition have to have exclamation marks. You had question marks. And this comes, uh, brings me to the second question or remark. When, after hearing the first speaker, I thought that's very interesting, very inspiring, very entertaining too, but does it help? Because after all, exaptation is ex post. You may notice it, but you cannot use it as a systematic quest for invention and innovation. Then I saw the slogan, the quotation of, uh, I think it's Ben, je veux être libre et fou, mais je n'arrive pas. And this is typically the oxymoron of all standard innovation meetings, workshops, symposia. They try to organize and to give, let's say, orders to be free and creative. And it's difficult, it's a difficult issue, but at least you had the merit <coughs> to protect us against this kind of official dom of upper ground and keep question marks open. Your uh, conference, your, your talk was entirely organized on question marks. So I think we are totally in the topic. I have no 
Killian question. Hopefully you have no clear answer, but this is precisely... <laughs> This but let, let's go for a middle ground type of uh, yeah, question, this is though. Yeah, typically the, the result of, of the middle Thank you. It's, it's very kind, this comment. Thank you very much. And I know we, we, we're having this conversation. Can we predict a little bit in your work here, Paolo? Do you do a bit of prediction of what will happen next to the tar molecule? Or can, can we? We talked about shadow possibilities or options just before the... the how, how do we sit with prediction? I mean, let me kind of for two short answers. First, do institutions favor or disfavor this type of discovery? And the, the, the simple answer is they did permit, if you want, accepted discoveries until about 30, 40 years ago. And now they basically are blocked because blocked, not completely. But they, if you discover something unexpected and you have to deliver against a clear set of deliverables because your salary depends on that, what do you do? You just hide it under the cap. So the evolution of the institutions has made this mode of discovery and technological development more and more different. Can we anticipate, not completely, but we have an idea of what may be, may be developed over a certain space of time. Uh, very shortly, uh, Chandler, uh, the American historian of, 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 of business and economics, basically makes a point that there's a set of firms that he calls the focused engineered firms. One of them is Corning. Corning, Corning, glass, glass work. If you study this so Corning, you see over 150 years, they have just invested in technologies without clear applications in mind, knowing that patient capital would allow those applications to emerge. There are some preconditions, freedom, diversity, high scanning of the bank, and so on. But when those applications emerge, if they know they will, but they don't know exactly where, they invest systematically and, um, and intensely. And why don't the competitors not do the same if it works? Now, that's, that's, most of the competitors, they don't follow the same logic. The most of the competitors are they follow the conglomerate logic, or anyway, they just follow the ideas that you have to know what you're doing. So you have to have a market applications before developing a technology. That's what most of the uh, competitors would, would do, which works. Just I, I think it's interesting also to think about the role of tension and what is the level of pressure on these companies. So some might be in a comfortable position when they have resources to allocate and they can afford risk taking and they know you know that can be a super advantage and others are in a survival mode and, and do they go for that? So th this variable could be quite interesting to look at um, yeah, in terms of where they are. Um, Final two out, three questions. Uh, yes. Oh, uh, sorry, I forgot my question right now. But um, um, yeah, I've got uh, an example, and I like the summary very much. So thank you. But uh, my, I don't know if you're talking about the art school, whether you're talking about the Villarson school. Yeah, there's Villarson. Oh, the I forgot to mention the other one you mentioned. That's the art school. I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, and as, as an example, my sister went to the Villarson and with very, very new ideas and so on, performance art, and what it is, because it's nothing in the end. You have, there's nothing concrete at the end of a performance. Um, and in the very beginning, she got whacked down. Every teacher said, you have, what is this? This is nothing. It took about three years where they said, I think I've got, I think I've understood what you're doing. So it went from being, hmm, to, oh, wait, to now actually it's a whole process and a whole <coughs> something that's actually happening around it. So also it really depends on who catches it at what point, and then it becomes art. Otherwise it just sits in that, you know, what is this area. <laughs> and then obviously it moves into the, into the top rank. But somebody's had to go through that process down at the very bottom scrambling to make themselves hurt before it gets to the, the top, right? Um, then just to link then with yourself. Um, I mean, I came, I came to this 
session here because of innovation and processes, because that's much more where I am, having left the large corporate world to go and be creative and make a change in the world uh, with food. So uh, high protein, vegan foods uh, with innovation of algae and plant proteins and things like that. Um, but, but struggling, struggling in, we know there's a market, we know people want to eat less meat, we know, but as a small institution, how to make yourself heard over the noise that's happening from the larger institutions who have the grip over the whole food industry and the communication that gets sent out as to what we should be eating and should not be eating. Um, and this is breaking down those barriers as well. Mm -hmm. um, and how, how do you then turn something which has been a supplement into an actual food? So doing that process there and bringing it into a different place than it should be, like algae. Yeah, so spirulina and chlorella shouldn't be a supplement. It should be actually food that's making up for meat and other proteins and different types of food. So it's part of that process as well. So how do you turn something which is known for this into this? Do you have any comments on that process? So yeah, we. We have a it's a it's it's a it's a it's a pattern that has happened many times in the history of food. Young used to be a pharmaceutical firm before before becoming uh, before becoming a food. And and so but but how to do that that's that's a that's a tough question. Um, I don't I don't know the answer about uh, it becomes a, a matter of strategy how you turn a latent, <coughs> and expressed, or partially expressed need into a successful business. And that becomes a matter of. Um, Maybe Renata has, has the, yeah. the question with her slide on middle ground, right? So, how do you respond to the upper ground or try to create these networks? It's not by staying put and just you know sitting with your idea, but tapping into networks that still exist they might not be with the, the higher level but they're still very active that's one way of looking at it but <laughs> i have, I'm, I'm I have a simpler, simpler i think that it's also a matter of of, of the internal organizational processes I'm, I'm originally an org design person so i like looking at what's happening what are the internal processes it's it's uh, it's basically um, how you know every every company will have a different um, a process for doing it or not doing it. So it, also, it depends on, on, on the company itself. Yeah, but it comes back to also your point mm -hmm. about, you know, large companies are giving, at, you know, in this ground where you can take risks and you can yeah. be creative and all that. I mean, if you're not actually physically uh, and financially taking the risk yourself, you don't want to take risks, right? Because yeah, so you're still in yeah. your comfort zone of getting the salary at the end of the month. And if I want to evolve in the company, well, I'm not going to shuffle too much, ruffle too many feathers, which as, as a completely independent group, you have the capacity to, to do that. And you don't want to end up being taken over by those large institutions and going back into what we've just fought very hard to get out of. Mm -hmm. And this is again with the middle grounds and how do you, yeah. how do you make sure that you're not working this way necessarily, but mm. actually shifting to a new upper ground, middle upper ground on a, on a, in mm. a vertical rather than just up and down. So it's more f from a business perspective because I was talking about the, the middle ground as a place where you know, artistic um, activities are yeah. right? The business is exactly the same. Yeah, absolutely. We have two final comments, yes, or, or questions. I think a bit with what you said. Um, I come from the private sector, I would say corporate uh, and you have the uh, land of schools where you have to innovate, you have to innovate, you have to innovate, but we don't really know how to do it. So my, my question was, um, I, I would like to hear what your thought is, like a new way of doing it, not that I've never heard of. Um, do you think there are methods that can can come from your impact that can be used uh, in either small or big companies 
we have been doing, basically one can, one can get convinced that there is a, a kind of secret geography, the specific planet, that, that is, that is, that is, uh, that is, um, that is congealed or hidden in the technologies or the competencies we have. So one could not only explore market demands, but could also start from the issue, what else can my competencies technologies to do. And then starting from that point of view, explore what that market demands, even later market demands. Uh, so that, that's a different approach. I mean, if we are marketing-led, that's fine, but uh, it's in, uh, that will cover only one part of the potential innovation. The other part of the innovation is what, can, what, what else can my technologies do, my competence? The problem is that to do that, you have to you have to be patient. So patience is key because you cannot mm -hmm. anticipate exactly if and when applications <coughs> will emerge, and especially you cannot anticipate in which area they will emerge. So you can go from pharmaceutical to food. I mean, those are two completely different market sectors with different rules, different institutions, different regulations, and that's tough. But without having this, without having this side organization in the sense that Renata was speaking, that becomes possible. Yeah, we, we did, um, so, sorry, can no, I just ahead. ask, uh, add a we, we started um, doing research together in, at, at Bayer, and basically they, correct me if I'm wrong, but they explained to us that most of the pharmaceutical companies are specializing, everybody is specializing, in, right, in one thing. So. You have like human or or animal or food or food, right? Uh, no, agriculture. Agriculture. So companies are kind of you know buying, selling, and these strategies of mergers, acquisitions, too specialized to build this one competence. And um, a buyer has decided um, uh, to keep the three areas going simply because there is a possibility of consultation of reusing what they find, let's say, in pharmaceutical uh, division, in uh, the, the animal division, and, and from, from, for example, agricultural division. So the, the, it's, it's a, they are kind of aware of the fact that there's, and they told us that there's quite a lot of that going on. They have libraries of all these um, uh, molecules that they kind of have people who think about it. So, it's, it's a matter of being aware, I, I imagine, by the top management and basically designing the organization and, and, and its strategy um, in a way that it, it kind of enables them. I'm sorry. If, if I may, a very simple uh, answer, perhaps, because I'm building on this. In creativity, we often think that we go from one thing to how it exists in different contexts. But perhaps one lesson here is to actually start from different contexts and to take mm -hmm. that one thing and put it yeah, in there absolutely. instead of just thing leading to context because it's going to be a much more predictable thing to start with an array of context and looking at that one thing so that could be yeah. yeah that's actually how many studies that you had to go from the starting point of the impact um, human environmental social profit and design backwards to that basically that we then start to understand the innovation Final. How do you use your picture? Your problem, I was fascinated by your talk. Uh, as I was. Uh, um, and it brought me, I'm an American, and it brought me back to the uh, classic political debate in the United States. Uh, every time that, that NASA's budget is discussed, there are people who say, you know, no, we've got to put it down. Uh, and, and it's only the people who, who 
are in favor of the pure side because they don't know what's going to come out, but they know that something's going to come out. They can't predict what's going to come out, but they know that something's going to come out, and you have to be committed to supporting the pure science because it's going to lead to applied science. And now, if, if you're in a system where the corporate board says, no, I want results because uh, I've got to have quarterly results and, and to, to be able to, to keep my stock, stock market price up, uh, they don't, they don't want to mess around with the, with the pure science. They don't want to mess around with the, the creativity and, and, and just let, let the you know, thing go and, and see what comes. How do you build the support for, uh, obviously, mm -hmm. I'm in favor of, of pure science because I don't know what's gonna, what it's going to create, but I know it's going to create something. How do you build the support, assuming that, that you agree with me, uh, how do you build the support Coalition uh, uh, to 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 allow you to. to <laughs> it's about answering. I would I would make three short points. First, it's not pure science per se. I mean, some of my example, pure science came afterwards to discover. So the material we made a function it revealed also an area of unknown unknown. With the antidepressant. There was no science on antidepressants. But the fact that we could cure depression stimulated the seek for science, why it happens. So it's not necessarily pure science. Second point is um, the European Union, for instance, has launched a new set of projects that they call high risk, uh, whereby they don't ask for clear deliverable at the very beginning. <coughs> That's one way. And apparently, they're more apparently now, again, one has to go into the details, but apparently they are more successful than traditional projects, whereby all the deliverables, methodologies, uh, time, base are to be declared in advance. <laughs> the third point is an anecdote. When the war of cancer was launched in 1981 by President Nixon, it was organized as a war. In a war, you have an objective, and whatever you discover on the side, which doesn't help directly with the ob objectives, is the goal. The result was zero. Zero drugs. Zero. Ten years of investment, zero drugs. Why? But I, if, I, if, if I were a, 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 an oncologist, historian of oncology, I would go all in those databases and see what they must have discovered in those ten years. Mm -hmm. Which, of course, they ignored because it was a war. In a war, you have to be focused. Mm -hmm. So treating that as a war was a fundamental error. <laughs> and that applies also to other things. The, 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 the NASA, uh, the moon project worked because we have the technology, we have the science already. The world of cancer, we, we still don't know what cancer is. No, but look, at, look at everything that's coming out of this research that even we don't know about when we start. But you know, the, the voyage of discovery, you're going to uh, have this. So basically, if you want, don't treat us at war. Yeah. Okay. do you have any other final... No, no, no. If I could ask Denise, I hope all of us. <laughs> 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 ah, yeah, but the carnival starts. <laughs> counter or actual? No, the actual, the, the oh, okay. four. Okay, <laughs> we come to the counter one. Yeah. Since it was, it was a great discussion, we didn't have time to cover issues like um, bad outcomes of all of this process because we have to account also these are happy accidents we talked about but think of social media and now existing mm -hmm. as a news outlet which was not supposed to be a place where people get news but now people get news from social media right. so so there is another dynamic but I think uh, we're gonna leave here with this idea of embedding open endedness in our processes and thank you very much both of you <laughs> round round of applause and we have some uh, crackers at the back Thank you. Thank you very much. Stop, please.